Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. All right. Good to see uh, people from all over the world here. Uh, so yeah, I will be talking about the Riemann Rock theorem for graphs and the tropical Riemann Rock theorem and applications to some questions in algebraic geometry. Uh, so to get started, let me share my screen. And I have um, some slides, so hold on one minute. All right, can you all see that? Yeah. Ma Madeline, we're good? Okay. Yeah. Great. So, um, Riemann Rock for graphs. Uh, today I'll be focusing on finite graphs. In the next lecture on Wednesday, uh, I'll talk about uh, tropical curves and metric graphs. But I want to start off very simple. Uh, so, we're going to play a game on the vertices of a finite graph. So here's the vertices of my graph, and I'll add one vertex um, up here as well. So it's a four vertex graph. I'm allowing multiple edges uh, between vertices, but no loops that go from a single vertex to itself. Uh, and what we're going to do is place some chips uh, on this graph. Uh, these will be, you can think of it as dollars, or many of you from all over the world, so convert to your favorite currency. But um, we have some integer number of dollars at each vertex, let's say uh, these amounts here. And we're going to play a game of solitaire, and the goal is to try to get all the vertices out of debt. So you see we have the minus two vertex, um, which is currently in debt, and our goal is, is to try to win. Now what are the rules of the game? So the rules are very simple. You can either lend $1 to each of your neighbors, um, or more precisely, across each edge going out of a vertex, you can lend $1, or you can borrow a dollar from each edge coming out. And so um, if we want to get out of debt, one thing we could do is take this um, vertex here that's at minus 2. Right, that vertex is currently in debt, and so we could borrow a dollar from uh, each neighbor. Now there's three neighboring edges, three adjacent edges to this vertex. So if we borrow a dollar from across each edge, we go from minus two up to uh, plus one, right? But each of the neighbors goes down by, by one from each edge. So because there are two edges going um, here and here, this goes from one down to minus one, because that vertex lent two dollars, one for each edge. And this vertex up top goes from zero down to um, minus one. Uh, so uh, we now have this situation. And a trivial observation, but one that will be important, we started with three dollars total. And we still have three dollars total, because we're not creating money or destroying money, we're just passing money around the graph. So we still have $3, but now we have two vertices in debt, but they're less in debt than the first vertex was. So maybe we've made some progress. Um, and indeed, what could we do? Well, this vertex up top um, has minus one, and we could, um, uh, let, me, let me switch to a different color here. So we could borrow a dollar from each of that vertices neighbors and go from minus one. There's two edges coming out of it. So it'll go from minus one to plus one. And each of the two neighbors goes down the dollar. So this one goes to three. And this one, which is at plus one, goes to zero. Um, now, if the minus one vertex at the bottom, we have one vertex still in debt. If that vertex uh, would borrow, then this, uh, the, the guy we started with would go back into debt, and that would seem to be a, possibly a bit circular. So instead of borrowing, let's have the rightmost vertex, which is rich with $3, lend. Um, and there's three edges. He has $3. So uh, if this guy lends, let's use one more color. Now this vertex will go down to zero, and each adjacent um, 
edge will pass one dollar along. So this goes from plus one to plus two, and this guy goes from minus one to plus one, and voila, everyone is out of debt now. So we won the game, hooray, lecture over. <clears throat> no, that's not the end of the lecture, it's just the beginning, because we want to understand this game, and in particular, what the heck does it have to do with algebraic geometry? Uh, so that's a good question. And I want to tell you, uh, first of all, a theorem about this game, which will lead us into some analogy with algebraic geometry. And so the theorem gives a, a sufficient criterion for when the game is winnable. So before I state the theorem, notice that we started with $3 total. We ended with $3. And um, it turns out for this particular graph, if you start with $3, no matter how it's distributed, if the total amount of money is $3, you can always win the game. And that statement would be false if I replace three by two. So three is the magic number here. And how is it a magic number? Well, um, it's an invariant of this graph. This graph has three independent cycles, right? So just to um, draw that before I state the theorem, uh, we've got, for example, this cycle here, this cycle here, and then this outer cycle here. Those are linearly independent in the obvious sense, I guess, um, of uh, looking at, say, one chains, or um, you could probably make sense of this in other ways. But uh, any other cycle I draw, like the outermost cycle, would be linearly equivalent to some linear combination of those three. So the cyclomatic number of the graph, or its genus, as I'll call it, is three. It's also the rank of the first homology group of the graph, if you want to think of it that way. And that turns out to be the, the key number for determining if you can always win the game or not. So let me um, state that as a theorem. So theorem, well, in this form, it's due to myself and Noreen. Um, but uh, I mean, this was known in another form by other authors uh, earlier. But let me not get into the whole history, or I'll get kind of distracted here. So the theorem is this. Let G, uh, which I'll call the genus, but graph theorists would call the cyclomatic number, number of edges minus number of vertices plus 1 is another formula for it or um, dimension of H1 of GR, okay? Uh, if the total number of dollars in the game is at least G, then um, it's always winnable. Now, in order to see what this has to do with algebraic geometry, uh, I want to interpret this in the following way. <clears throat> so the initial, let me go back here. Um, oh, that's a big mess now, but um, so let me redraw it. Um, Matt, maybe very just briefly for the people who yeah. arrived late, you could recall what the game is. Oh, okay, did people, yeah, um, sure. So let me recall the game in the process of redrawing it. Uh, so we had a graph, could be any graph. It's not just a theorem about this particular graph, any connected graph. Uh, and we started with some money. So in, in our case, we started with minus two here, oh, and there was a vertex at the top but we didn't put any chips there. We had one at the bottom and four on the side. So we're gonna think of this as a divisor on the graph. All right, so a divisor on a graph will just be an assignment of an integer to each vertex. And the degree of the divisor is the total amount of money present, okay? So degree of a divisor is the sum of uh, D of V over all vertices. Okay, where D of V denotes the amount of money at the vertex V. And so what we're saying is that if the degree of a divisor is at least the genus of the graph, 
then this game is always winnable. Oh, and Madeline asked me to repeat what the game is. So the game is that you're allowed to either lend a dollar to each neighbor or borrow a dollar from each neighbor. But you have to either lend to all your neighbors at once or borrow from all of them at once. Um, you can't uh, treat certain neighbors differently. And by neighbor, I'm really talking about the edges, not the vertices. So if there's two edges, uh, like in the bottom left here, between um, two given vertices, then you have to pass $2, uh, one across each edge. All right, and so let's rephrase all this in a way that looks more like um, algebraic geometry. So we'll say that um, two vertices are linearly equivalent, and I'll just write it as d is equivalent to d prime like this, um, if uh, we can get from d to d prime with a um, legal sequence of moves. Okay, and um, if D is non-negative, so every vertex has a non-negative label, that means it's out of debt. That's what I was calling out of debt. We call it um, effective. So an effective advisor is one where all the vertices are out of debt. And um, we're interested in which divisors are linearly equivalent to an effective divisor. Right? That means if you're linearly equivalent to an effective divisor, it means you can win the game. You can get everyone out of debt, and otherwise you can't. Um, so in other words, the theorem from the previous page, which I'll go back to now, can be restated. So this theorem up top here says that um, if the degree of a divisor is at least the genus of the graph, then that divisor is equivalent to some effective divisor. And this, of course, um, if you know the theory of algebraic curves, there is a very similar fact that falls from the riemann roch theorem in algebraic geometry, uh, which is quite useful. And um, so we want to explore this a little bit deeper now and see that, in fact, this theorem here about the game always being winnable is actually a corollary of a more general theorem called the riemann roch for, theorem for graphs which uh, I can state in a way that looks exactly like the classical algebraic geometry theorem. And so uh, let me add a couple of more definitions here. So um, we need to define the rank of a divisor. And so I'm going to define it to be minus 1 if d is not equivalent to an effective divisor. Okay, so if you can't win the game, R of D is, is minus one. Otherwise, it'll be non-negative. So otherwise, we define R of D to be the maximum of all uh, natural numbers K, such that um, D minus E is equivalent to an effective divisor. For all effective divisors E of degree K. So let me unpack this for you. Right, what does that actually say? Uh, so that says that um, R of D will be zero if it's D is equivalent to an effective divisor, so you can win the game. But there's um, some way to remove a dollar from some vertex so that you can't win the game anymore. Okay, that would mean R of D is zero. R of D will be at least one if no matter how you subtract a dollar, you can still win the game. And R of D is at least two if no matter how you subtract two dollars, you can still win the game, etc. Okay? So it's a purely combinatorial um, thing that's pretty easy to understand. And to state the riemann roch theorem now, we have all the tools except for just one more thing. We need the canonical divisor of a graph. And this is just the sum over all vertices V of the degree or valency of that vertex minus two times V. Okay. 
Okay, so at I'm, I'm writing divisors like elements of a free abelian group rather than as functions of the vertices, but um, that's again just for analogies with algebraic geometry. Um, so at each vertex v, you put degree of v minus two chips. Okay, so in our running example here, uh, what would the canonical divisor be? I'll put it in, um, it's a good color for the canonical divisor, I'll put it in blue. Uh, so the canonical divisor would have one chip here, uh, two chips in the middle, one chip on the right, and um, zero chips up top. Whoops. Zero chips up top. Okay. So um, I don't know what I just did. All right, I see. So that's the uh, canonical divisor. And now let's state the riemann roch theorem. So theorem, again, this is uh, due to myself and Noreen. Um, and Matt, we can call you it the quickly, what is the degree of a vertex? Oh, yeah. So the degree of a vertex is the um, number of edges incident to that vertex. Right? So you might call that the valency. Um, so if you have a vertex like this, its degree is five. And you would put three chips there for the uh, canonical divisor. Right? All right, so the theorem is, if G is any connected finite graph, D is any divisor on G, then um, R of D minus R of canonical minus D is degree of D plus one minus the genus. So if you imagine um, the analogy in algebraic geometry would be that if R of D is, you want to think of this as analogous to H naught of the line bundle L of D minus one. And the reason the minus one is natural is because L of D, those are the effective divisors equivalent to D, or sorry, L of, um, yeah, Effective divisors. <clears throat> okay, so so usually you would define this. Um, sorry, in a slightly different way. So L of D. Let me not define it because I don't need it in this talk. But um, the point is, this is the dimension of what I'll call bar D. Bar D is a projective space um, consisting of all effective divisors linearly equivalent to D. Okay, and it has a natural structure of a, of a projective space, and it's the dimension of that. It's called the complete linear system associated to D. Um, so if you think of the riemann roch theorem as, as being about this function, then um, this is exactly analogous, okay? So what I wanna do in the rest of the talk um, is first of all explain, give a sketch of the proof of this theorem, and then explain um, how this is more than just an analogy with the riemann roch theorem and algebraic geometry, there is actually a link between them that uh, there's various ways to explain how, where that link comes from, but I'll make one particular choice here. Um, and I'll try to explain that in fact, there's an inequality relating R of D on an algebraic curve to R of a related divisor on, on some associated graph. And then in the next lecture, I'll explain applications of that principle, okay? So then any questions before I sketch a, a proof of this? All right, let me just point out, I won't write it out explicitly, but if the degree of D is at least G, then it follows from the definitions that R of D is greater than or equal to zero. And um, that's a simple exercise for you. And that means D is equivalent to an effective divisor. So that was the first theorem that we stated. Okay. So it is a, uh, this is a, a significant generalization of that previous result. Um, um, Matt, two questions yeah. in the chat. So one is, um, can you go back to the definition of rank? And the other one is, when we say that a divisor is greater than or equal to zero, what do you mean? Right. So D greater than or equal to zero um, means just that d of v is greater than or equal to zero for all v. 
Okay, so every vertex has a non-negative integer attached to it. And the definition of rank is here. Um, the rank of D is the maximal positive in non-negative integer K, so that if you subtract any effective divisor of degree K from D, it's still equivalent to something effective. So it's sort of a robustness of, you know, not only is D equivalent to an effective divisor in this case, but even if you subtract any effective divisor of degree K, it's still equivalent to something effective. All right. So let's give a quick sketch of the proof. And the details of this will be in the problem session tomorrow. So there's, um, um, I don't know exactly how this works because I haven't been part of the other um, talks in this conference so far, but there'll be some problem sheets and some TAs and you'll be able to go through um, a detailed proof of the uh, riemann rock theorem for graphs. But let me just sketch the idea here because um, I think the ideas are, are actually important because you'll see that part of the interest of this whole theory is that we have some combinatorial tools available in the case of graphs that we don't really have in algebraic geometry. And that's why we can actually prove some theorems in algebraic geometry uh, in, a, in a new way using these combinatorial tools. So I want to explain what the combinatorial tools are, and they go into the proof of this theorem, in fact, so it's all kind of related. So the, the tool I want to quickly explain is what are called reduced divisors. This is kind of the, the key um, idea in the, in the proof. And in the interest of time, I think I'm actually going to skip the formal definition of reduced divisor. You'll have that in the problem sets. Um, and I'll just give you some, an equivalent description, which is more intuitive, but not as good as a, as a formal definition. Um, so I'm gonna write down an example again, just to, to show you how this works. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> right, so rather than give you a formal definition, I'm going to give you an example. Let's start at our, um, the same divisor we had before. So minus two, one, four, and up here we had zero. Now, reduced divisors are <laughs> defined relative to the choice of some reference vertex, and you you, it's an arbitrary choice. So I'm gonna choose this vertex over here as the reference vertex. Okay, now the idea of reduced divisors is that there's gonna be exactly one of them in each linear equivalence class. So they are like representatives, distinguished representatives for the equivalence classes. Um, but as I said, you, they're not completely canonical. You have to choose a reference vertex. And I'll always call the reference vertex Q. Um, so Q will be our, our reference vertex, and we want to know what it means to be Q reduced. So first of all, it means that all the vertices other than Q should be out of depth. So in, in this case, um, so condition one is that D of Q to be reduced, D of Q should be, oh, sorry, um, D of Q, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be anything. but um, it's a condition on the other vertices. So D of V should be non-negative for all V not equal to Q. Okay, so I'm defining D is Q reduced, if and only if. So that's the first condition. And the second condition, is that um, when you perform something called Dar's burning algorithm, which I'll explain in just a moment, um, the whole 
graph gets burnt. Okay, so what is DAR's burning algorithm? So what you do is you imagine that the integer at each vertex represents how many firefighters are standing at that vertex. Okay, so down um, at the bottom in the middle, we have one firefighter. At the very right, we have four firefighters, which is a bit overkill. And at the top, we don't have any firefighters. And the idea is that each firefighter can block the fire in one direction. Okay, so if you have two edges coming out of a, of a vertex, well, okay, you, you'll see what I mean. So you light a fire at the starting vertex Q and it starts to spread. So the fire starts spreading, for example, here, and there is one firefighter at that vertex, so the fire stops temporarily. Okay, but um, the fire also continues in this direction. And once it reaches this vertex, there's two fires coming in and only one firefighter. So this firefighter, this vertex gets overwhelmed and the fire continues to spread. So it spreads, but it stops here because there's four firefighters at that vertex and we only have two fires. All right, but that's not all, right? There's another fire coming across the top edge. So this fire spreads here and there's no firefighters there. So it immediately overwhelms that vertex and keeps going. But it stops here because there's four firefighters there and only um, three fires. So this last vertex is a, um, a stronghold here and has prevented the whole graph from getting burnt. I mean, just that last vertex didn't get burnt through, but that means this is not, um, this divisor is not reduced. Okay. So, um, actually this sort of tells you what to do if you wanna get closer to a reduced divisor. So what you would do in this case is when you have a divisor that is um, fails the burning algorithm like this, what you're supposed to do is perform a lending move, or it's often called a firing move in the theory of chip firing. You're going to lend a dollar from that vertex to each of its neighbors. And sort of by definition, if the fire stopped here, then um, you have to have enough chips uh, to lend. I mean, you'll see another example of this in a minute. But um, so the point is that the way this works is we're going to be able to um, repeat this process now. So this vertex on the right, which had four dollars, lends a dollar to each neighbor. So now he's down to one. This guy goes up to three. This one goes up to one. This one stays at minus two. By the way, you'll notice the definition of reduced divisor, it does not matter what the label at Q is. We never change Q at this point. So Q is the same. Q is here. And it doesn't matter if there's minus two chips here or a million chips here. Uh, Definition of reduced divisor doesn't care about the value at Q, just pointing that out. So this new divisor I've drawn is equivalent to the first one. They're linearly equivalent, yeah? Um, but this one is, I claim, closer to being reduced in some precise sense. So um, you perform the burning algorithm again. And what happens? Okay, so we start burning. There's a firefighter stopping that one. Um, this fire stops and this fire gets stopped because there's three firefighters there and only two fires. So actually this is not reduced either. And I said that, um, yeah, so not reduced because we've got the fire stops. Not reduced. 
but what's kind of weird, right, is that I said it's closer to being reduced, but it looks like it's somehow further from being reduced because we almost burnt the whole graph before, and this time we got stopped earlier. But it turns out there's a way to make sense of this where we've actually made some progress here, and this is actually closer. Okay. How do I certify that it's, it's closer and what do I do now? I'm trying to get to an equivalent divisor that is reduced. So what I want to do is look at the unburnt portion of the graph. I'll draw that in blue. So everything that hasn't been burnt yet, yet I draw in blue. And what I want to do is fire all of those vertices simultaneously or do a lending move or you can do them in sequence because this, this is commutative. It doesn't matter if I fire vertex A then B or B then A, okay, it, it's the same. So just fire each of these vertices once, it means perform a lending move one time. And what happens when you do that? So we're gonna get some equivalent divisor and let's figure out what it is. Well, um, So I claim you'll end up with still one chip over here, right? Even though that vertex lends $3 out, it gets them back because the other two, the neighboring vertices are also firing, right? So every dollar that gets passed to the left by this rightmost guy is gonna get passed back when the other vertices fire. So the internal edges, the blue edges here in this picture, they cancel out. There's no net money transferred along them. Money only gets transferred along the red edges that go from the blue component over to the red component. So if you like, you can just ignore the, the blue component and just think of what happens to the left of it. And so the, the net result is gonna be this, that the, this vertex I just drew in that had one chip, um, it's gonna go down to zero, right? Because it passes one chip to the left. The vertex below it, which had three is gonna go down to one because it passes two chips along that, those uh, red edges. And then the minus two, our reference vertex Q has gained three chips in the process. So it goes up to plus one. Sorry, I'm supposed to say plus one. I have um, terrible handwriting on an iPad, I apologize. Um, so this is one now. So this is also equivalent to the, um, above divisor, you have to do three firing moves to see that it's equivalent. I just combine them into one, into one move. But these are equivalent as well. So this is equivalent to the original divisor. And this one I claim is now reduced. So let's burn one more time and see that. So we start um, the fire asked, here. Which vertices did we just fire? The blue ones, the ones that are circled in blue. So everything but Q, okay? If you fire each of those, the internal contributions along the blue edges cancel out and you'll just get this. I mean, I could do it in three stages if, if I had more time, but I'll let you guys work that out as an exercise for yourself. Okay, so if you fire the three blue, blue vertices, um, then you are left with this situation. And now let's run the burning algorithm. So you see it burns through this vertex because there's no firefighters there. It temporarily gets stopped here. But now if we um, start burning, we overwhelm this one firefighter vertex here and the fire continues. And now already there's two fires, only one firefighter, so that gets burnt. And of course this um, burns as well. And so we've now burnt the whole graph. And so this divisor is reduced. So it turns out that um, we have the following theorem. So every uh, divisor, so fix any Q in the set of vertices of your graph. This is 
proof is more or less the algorithm I just showed you. Okay, it's an algorithmic proof that you just step by step bring it closer to being reduced. I didn't explain the part, I mean, condition one in a reduced divisor, if you look back, is that um, condition one here says that D of V is non-negative for every vertex other than Q. And in this case, I started with that. But what if I had other vertices in debt besides Q? Um, well, then you have to make an argument to show that you're equivalent to something where only Q is in debt. It's not too hard. It's a little bit tricky to prove that formally, but it's not hard to imagine why that's true because the value at Q doesn't matter in the definition of reduced divisor. So Q can just borrow, you know, it's like the US government right now. You just borrow as much money as you want and you don't worry about it um, till later. So uh, Q just keeps borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. Um, Oh, sorry, excuse me. I, I meant to say lend, Q lends. The other vertices can, uh, can borrow. Or Q can lend money. It's sort of symmetric, right? So imagine Q is the, uh, the Fed and there's a crisis. So Q, Q just starts lending money out. And Q will go into debt, but that doesn't matter in the definition of reduced divisor. So you can just flood the rest of the graph with money. All the neighbors of Q will now have a lot of money and they can start passing it along to their neighbors and keep going. And it's not hard to show that in the end, you, you can achieve a situation where everyone's out of debt, but now you have to pass money back towards Q using this burning algorithm to try to get it reduced. And that's where the uniqueness comes from, okay? So you go through that in the exercises. Any other questions about DAR's burning algorithm and reduced divisors? All right, so I'm not gonna explain exactly how this implies Riemann rock because I mean, there's several more steps in the argument and probably better at this point to leave that to the exercises. But I did want to um, at least explain reduced divisors because that's really the key tool that gets used when you analyze um, divisors on graphs in applications to algebraic geometry. But now I'd like to shift gears and actually try to explain the connection to algebraic geometry. All right. So. This I will call um, specialization theory. And there's different ways to explain this. And in different contexts, I use different versions. For this talk, I want to do it in terms of line bundles. Line bundles are a little bit um, perhaps less intuitive than um, V divisors on curves, but uh, it's a little bit actually easier to give the definitions <coughs> quickly in, um, in this case using this language. So what I want to do is I have the following algebraic curve, and I mean a nice one, so let's say complete non-singular um, Matt, there seems to be some field. problem with the audio. Are you there? Oh, yeah. It sounded can like you not the microphone was covered. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, I might have covered the microphone by accident, sorry. Okay, so X is a complete non-singular curve over some field K. Now in one version of this theory, we could work over an algebraically closed um, field, but I want to work over a um, discretely valued field for reasons that you'll see in a minute. Um, in the next talk, uh, I'll change the setup just a little bit. So K here is going to be a discretely valued field. Right, so what does um, that mean? It just means it's a field together with a valuation into, let's say, Z. Um, and uh, the valuation is a function that, um, well, if you like, you can define the valuation of zero to be infinity, and then um, I could extend it to K. But it should have the property that valuation of AB is valuation of A plus valuation of B. And 
Evaluation of A plus B is greater than or equal to the minimum. Evaluation A, evaluation B. And so two examples to keep in mind. If you're a number theorist, you might think about the periodic numbers or just Q with the um, periodic valuation on it. And another example that's more geometric would be rational functions <clears throat> uh, in one variable over, let's say, the complex numbers. And now the order of vanishing at t is evaluation. Okay, so I'll assume that this is familiar. And in this situation, what I want to do is associate a graph to this curve. The association is not quite canonical, but it's close enough to being canonical for our purposes that I can essentially talk about it as an invariant of the curve. And I'm going to do this in such a way that um, if I have a line bundle uh, on the curve, but you could just think of that as a divisor if you want, but more formally, it's an equivalence class, linear equivalence class of divisors. Um, that line bundle will give rise um, to a um, divisor class on the curve. So um, uh, on the graph, excuse me. So it, it'll, um, let me just write it this way. The linear equivalence class of some divisor. So this is um, divisors on the graph mod this equivalence relation of uh, chip firing or money lending. Okay, so I want to explain in a little bit of detail how this works. So I have to explain how do you get the graph, and if you start with the line bundle, how do you get a um, equivalence class of divisors on the graph? All right, so we've talked about models. Now the other way to do this, by the way, uh, is using Berkovich spaces which is really how I secretly think about all this, and I'll maybe say a little bit about that next time. But Enrica um, is gonna give a talk next week, a, a series of talks like this one, on Berkovich spaces, and I think it's more appropriate to just wait until she explains those things, and then you'll understand um, this better. So right now I'll explain it without Berkovich spaces. But Berkovich spaces are some kind of spaces of valuations, and it fits very nicely into this picture. All right, so first we have to explain the, the graph. And the idea is this, that um, inside of K, we have uh, a, a valuation ring R. These are the um, elements of valuation non-negative. So for example, ZP inside of QP, or polynomials inside of rational functions, are examples of valuation rings in this sense. And a valuation ring is a local ring, so it has a unique maximal ideal given by um, things of valuation strictly positive. That's uh, the unique maximal ideal, it turns out. And then we'll let little k be the residue field R mod M. All right, and with that preliminary notation out of the way, the idea is that we want to choose a nice model of our curve over the valuation ring. So this will be an R model of the curve X. And that just means that it's a, a scheme over R whose generic fiber, so if you look just, if you base change, if you like, to spec of K, or if you just look generically um, at this curve, then it, it's the original curve we started with. So formally, I should fix an isomorphism or something like that, but not in this talk. Um, just trying to give you the idea here. You know, this model should also be proper and flat, but um, 
let's not get uh, sufficiently technical. The, the really important um, property is I do want x to be uh, regular. which again, I, I won't define because, I mean, if you haven't seen it before, it's not gonna help to say it in one minute. And if you have seen it, then um, I'll trust that you have some familiarity with this concept. But for scheme, regularity is, is some analog of smoothness or non-singularity for, for schemes. Um, and there is always a, a regular model um, for your curve over some discrete valuation ring like this. Uh, but I want another condition as well. So I, I, I need this condition and another condition. I want to assume that X is um, semi-stable. In fact, by semi-stable, I mean what people would usually call something like strongly semi-stable. So let me explain what that means. Um, Matt, do you have a reference to recommend um, in case someone wants to see all of the details of this? Um, yeah, I mean, in general, I, I wrote a paper with Dave Jensen, a survey paper that talks about everything that I'm talking about in these lectures plus more. Uh, and then there are references in there for the various things that are being referred to. I mean, if you just for regularity, you can look in Hartshorn or Ching Lu has a book specifically about, you know, arithmetic surfaces like this, like this fracture X over R. Um, so yeah, those are some references. Thanks. Um, okay, and so what does semi-stable mean? It's a condition on the singularities of the special fiber. So one thing to know about regularity is that it's an analog of smoothness, but it doesn't mean that all the fibers are smooth. It's the condition on the total space. And so um, the generic fiber is X, so that was a smooth curve, but the special fiber, if you like, that means you know, reduce mod the maximal ideal. And now you're looking over, at a, you have a scheme over the residue field. Um, this thing might have singularities, and in general, they could be pretty terrible but we want to assume that they're nice. So we just have normal crossing type singularities, okay? And um, so only simple nodes. All components are individually smooth. That's what it actually means to be strictly semi-stable so we don't have like self-intersections of these components. All right, so we want to assume that the special fiber looks like this and that the total space is regular. Now you might ask, can you always find such a model? And the answer is no. Um, in general, you have to make a, a, a base change to achieve this. You might have to take a finite extension of your ground field. So um, there's something called the semi-stable reduction theorem. Which says that um, there exists k prime over k finite extension. such that uh, x base change to k prime has a regular semi-stable model. I mean, usually you would just have the word semi-stable here, but it's true that <coughs> you can also get a regular semi-stable model after a finite base change. So one thing we're gonna have to talk about, which I'll probably do at the beginning of the next lecture, is uh, what happens to what I'm about to show you when you make a finite base change. Because um, it turns out the graph I'm about to define is not quite invariant under finite base extension. And I mean, this is a little bit of a technical problem, but I'll show you how to deal with this. Okay? But let's just assume for the rest of this talk, so I'll deal with the base change issue next time. For the rest of this talk, we're gonna assume that we've already made that finite base extension so that actually we have a regular semi-stable model over K. All right, so assumption for the rest of this talk. And next time I'll show you why this is harmless. Uh, there exists a regular semi-stable model X um, over R itself, not, not over some base change. So given this, um, I want to define 
the dual graph of the special fiber, and that'll be the graph that we're interested in. So our graph G, which depends on X, but depends on this chosen model, um, but I'll discuss in a moment the, how serious that dependence really is. Uh, it's defined as follows. So the vertices of G are in bijection with the irreducible components of the special fiber. So when you reduce mod the maximal ideal, you might get different components, but we're assuming they intersect transversely. Vertices just correspond to components and edges correspond to nodes of the special fiber, that is to intersections between components. And that defines a graph. Uh, maybe next time I'll introduce some vertex weights as well to keep track of the genus of those components. But I think for now, since I'm running out of time, I won't do that. Um, but in general, it's probably a good thing to do. But instead, I want to give you a detailed example so that you can see what we're talking about here. And so here's, here's an example that should clarify this. So take K to be um, rational functions in one variable T over the complex numbers. And um, let me define uh, a curve by the following equation. So my curve X will be defined by this equation, X squared minus 2y squared plus z squared. This is going to be a homogeneous equation in three variables, so it'll define a curve in the projective plane, times x squared minus z squared plus t times y cubed z. And then I'm setting that equation equal to 0. So this, um, since this has integral coefficients, it defines an integral model. And so if, in general, you have to sort of clear denominators uh, in order to get an integral model. But in this case, uh, I've already written down an integral equation. So just taking the scheme uh, over, the, over R, over the polynomial ring defined by this equation, I get um, a model. But I'm going to call it x prime over R rather than fractor x. because um, this is not regular, turns out. So that's a computation that it's worth doing if, you don't, if, if you're not comfortable with these things. But um, there's one point where this is not regular. And let me try to um, at least just show you what's happening. So what is the special fiber of this model? Let's try to draw it. Uh, that's basically setting t equal to zero, right? That's the maximal ideal here is, um, corresponds to uh, valuation t bigger than zero. So uh, we're setting, well, the idea is we're setting t equal to zero. Um, just like reducing mod p, you would set p equal to zero. Hey, Matt, and in this case, a, uh, we had a request for a, just a quick summary or a big picture overview of what's happened in the lecture so far. Oh, okay. Um, just a minute. I, I will do that. Um, but let me just finish this thought. Okay. Uh, so let me just draw what the special fiber looks like. So this equation that I've written down over here factors, right? Once you set t equal to zero, you have a product of two terms. And one of those terms, x squared minus z squared, is of course x minus z times x plus z. So you have a product of two lines and an irreducible conic. So that's what I've drawn here. When you set this equal to zero, you get two lines and a conic. And this is how they intersect. And so the graph associated to this, um, I'll call it g prime. The graph looks like uh, this. It's the same graph we've been dealing with, actually, but there's no vertex at the top. 
Um, so these three vertices here correspond to the three irreducible components, the two lines. So if this is L1, L2, and a conic C, this vertex corresponds to L1, this to L2, and this vertex to C. And the edges tell you how those components intersect each other. And all I've done is set t equal to zero in that equation and factor it. That's how I get this graph. The problem is this total space is not regular. At this, um, at the intersection of the two lines here, you can check that the scheme is not regular. So regularity actually means, I said I wouldn't give the definition, but it means that the, it's a two-dimensional scheme. Regularity would mean the maximal ideal can be generated by two elements, but you actually need three elements to generate the maximal ideal at this point. It's gonna be something like t, x, and y. And you can't reduce it further. Um, or x and z maybe. Anyway, um, it's not regular at this point. But, um, okay, what is the big picture here? We're trying to define a graph associated to an algebraic curve. And I'm trying to do it in such a way that um, the, the Riemann rock formula on the curve is related to the Riemann rock formula on this graph. Okay, this is the, the big picture idea. So let me quickly go through the rest because I need to finish up. And then um, next time we'll kind of recap this and put it in a more general context and give some applications. So the idea is simply this, that um, first of all, I have to modify the curve a little bit to make it regular. So I have to blow up this point on the special fiber. So this singular point that I've drawn here, the bad point, maybe I'll put it in, in red, um, it is a uh, point on a surface. I've only drawn the, the special fiber, which is a curve, but it's living on a surface that I don't know how to draw. Um, and this point on that surface is singular, so we can blow it up. And uh, I'm not going to go through the arithmetic of how to do that, but what it does is it replaces the intersection of those two components by a whole line called the exceptional divisor. And we still have the conic. But now those L1 and L2 no longer intersect. Instead, they intersect some new curve E that we've drawn in. And what does that do? This will be my new model X, where I've blown up the bad point. And what does that do to the graph? Well, it adds a new vertex corresponding to the exceptional divisor. And that vertex lives up here. So I get a graph G, it's exactly the graph we were considering earlier. And um, this graph is sort of naturally associated to um, this model fractor X. And actually curves more or less have minimal regular models. I mean, mo in most cases they do. Uh, P1, the gene is zero, you don't have minimal regular models. And, but I mean, in practice, um, there's essentially a unique minimal model and it gives rise to a canonical graph. And so I can think of this graph as an invariant of the original curve and it turns out, but I'll have to explain this next time because I didn't time this perfectly. Um, turns out there's a way to go from a line bundle on the curve. Um, well, I can actually go from a line bundle on this model to a divisor D on the graph. I'll explain next time how to do that. Uh, and then if I start with a line bundle on the curve, there's actually different ways to extend it to a line bundle on this surface, but different ways of extending it correspond to linear chip firing equivalent divisors. That's where the connection comes from between this game we started out playing and algebraic geometry. The different ways of extending a line bundle on a curve to a model of that curve give you linearly equivalent divisors. And so I'll get a well-defined divisor class of divisors on the graph. And then let me just state the, the, the theorem that we'll discuss more next time. Uh, if I compare the rank on the graph of this divisor in the sense of riemann rock for graphs, it's always bigger than or equal to um, 
sorry, the rank of the line bundle on the curve. So, um, or I guess I was calling it, excuse me, little, not fractor L, just L. So the rank can only go up when you go from curves to graphs, but it can't go down. And this is the key thing that connects algebraic geometry to combinatorics, and we'll exploit this in the next lecture. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have now. Um, thanks, Matt. And everyone, you can write your applause into the chat. Yes, I love reading applause. <laughs> Um, so I don't think any questions got lost in there, um, but one person did ask uh, earlier for a reference on the relationship between um, the construction of these graphs and Berkovich analytification. Yeah, that's also explained in my paper with Dave Jensen, um, or in my paper that's called, um, I don't know, Specialization of Linear Series from Curves to Graphs or something like that. Um, I talk a little bit about Berkovich spaces there, talk about it more in the survey paper with Dave Jensen. I'm sure there's other references, but those are the ones that come to mind right now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and someone put the survey paper already in the chat, so um, oh, great. everyone should have that available. Um, okay, so if there's any other questions, um, you can either unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it in the chat. Um, okay, yeah, someone says, can you say something about the relationship between the intersections and the divisor of the line bundle? Uh, yes, right. Um, so, okay, let, I think to answer that, I'll just quickly give the definition that I skipped, um, which is, what is the, divisor associated to the line bundle. So if I have, let's assume I've already extended my line bundle to a line bundle on this arithmetic surface, this model. How do I go to a divisor on the graph? Uh, all I do is um, I take the sum over all vertices of my graph. Um, the, by definition, a vertex corresponds to an irreducible component of the special fiber. So let's call that Z. Mm -hmm. And I take the coefficient of, of V on the graph is going to be uh, the degree of this line bundle restricted to that component of the special fiber. And the degree of this restriction, another name for that is just the intersection of the line bundle L with the curve. So you see irreducible components of the special fiber are curves on the surface. Um, and so they're irreducible, so they're divisors. And so you can intersect a, a line bundle. So it has an associated line bundle too, and you can intersect them. So this is really coming from intersection theory on surfaces in the end. And so actually um, intersections of these curves Z on my special fiber directly translate into chip firing moves as, as I'll explain at the beginning of next lecture. So intersection theory on surfaces is very much um, in the background here. Um, thanks. And then another question. Um, can you remind us what is R sub X of L? R X of L. Oh, yeah, yeah. So R X of L is this classical thing, H zero of L minus one. Um, so it's the dimension of the space of global sections of the line bundle. And then we're subtracting one. 
to make it a projective thing rather than a affine thing. And then, okay, so that's um, just the, mm -hmm. a related question to this slide. Um, can you say so in this theorem? Can you say uh, when the equality holds? No, that's tricky. Um, yeah, that's a people have looked at that question, and um, it, it's uh, it's a tricky thing. So that's kind of what's mysterious about the subject. In fact, I mean, if we could characterize equality and say more about that, then in some sense it would mean Riemann Rockford graphs and curves were very closely related. And then we could try to prove one in terms of the other and really do a, a lot of things like that. But it turns out, I mean, it's very difficult to characterize this condition. And so we're sort of left with having to deal with inequalities. Uh, I mean, I could give you some examples in the next lecture of where it hold, where it's equality or where it's not, but Characterizing it is hard. Um, thanks. And then the uh, the last question that I see right now is, um, can you explain how uh, the idea of reduced divisors is used to prove the Riemann Rock theorem for graphs? Yeah, I can. But how long am I allowed to answer that for? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so. Okay, very quickly, the idea is like this. Um, so you can prove the following theorem. Uh, let's see, how do I say this quickly? All right, so before I state the theorem, let me uh, give you a quick definition. So you start um with an acyclic orientation of your graph so that means that you are orienting each edge in one direction or the other in such a way that there are no directed cycles and to an acyclic orientation you can associate a divisor which is for each vertex V, you put the in degree in the orientation minus one. So number of inward pointing arrows, number of edges that point into V as opposed to out of V minus one. And it's a simple exercise to show that this always has degree G minus one. And it's a slightly harder exercise to show that R of d is minus one. In other words, these divisors are not equivalent to an effective divisor. That's the first theorem, um, that we have a, a, a way to produce lots of divisors that um, are not equivalent to effectives, but they're sort of maximal with that property because they have degree g minus one. And as I said, if you have degree g or higher, you're always equivalent to an effective divisor. And so reduced divisors are used to prove the following theorem. So I mean, what I just wrote is actually pretty easy to prove, but there's a little trick to it. The theorem is that um, you can show that every divisor D uh, satisfies one of the following two things. So either D is equivalent to an effective divisor, in other words, R of D is non-negative. Or, and this is actually an exclusive or, they can't both happen. Um, or, there exists some acyclic orientation such that um, the divisor, oh, sorry, I called it D sub O. This is equivalent to an effective divisor. Um, and <clears throat> it turns out that the proof of this uses Dar's burning algorithm. So I'll just say in words what you do. 
you start um, with your divisor D. If it's already effective, then um, you win. You're in case one. If it's not effective, it's equivalent to some reduced divisor. Um, and that reduced divisor, so D is equivalent to some D prime, which is Q reduced. If we're not in case one, we must have D of Q is negative. Otherwise, D prime would be effective and we would have been in case one. And now you run the burning algorithm. You light your graph on fire. And what you have to do is keep track of the direction in which the fire spreads. So um, uh, the fire maybe spreads this way and this way and this way, but maybe it gets blocked at the bottom now. Um, and then it keeps going here. And then maybe that burns through this vertex and goes that way and that way. And now the fire gets overwhelmed and you burn through the whole graph. So note these arrows keep track of the direction of that fire. That will define an acyclic orientation. Now you can check that um, the divisor associated to this acyclic orientation minus the D prime is, um, is effective. OK, so in this case, um, D O minus D prime will be effective. And that just follows from the, the burning algorithm and the definition of reduced divisors. So that's um, the key result. And how does this connect with Riemann rock? Well, I mean, you can imagine that we're getting close because either R of D is greater than equal to zero or I've produced something of degree G minus one, which has R of D equal to minus one with this property. And the last kind of thing to note is that um, if you take the reverse orientation and you add these two divisors together, you get something of degree 2g minus 2. And it turns out you always get the canonical divisor of the graph. So there's a certain involution here. So using this involution trick, plus induction on um, something, R of D or on the degree, or I forget now. But using an inductive argument, um, this theorem here and this identity involving the canonical divisor, these two things imply Riemann rock in a fairly straightforward way using induction. So the key step is to prove this theorem, and that is really a direct consequence of Dar's burning algorithm. So that's a sketch for you anyway, and the details will be on the worksheet. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then one last question is, what is the reason for introducing these surfaces and specialization? Ah, well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the motivation, maybe I should have started with more motivation. Um, but the idea is that we're going to be able to now relate divisors on this graph to divisors on the original curve. And that lets us use combinatorial tools like reduced divisors um, to study questions about algebraic curves and vice versa. We can actually use theorems about algebraic curves to prove theorems about graphs. Uh, so you'll see in the next lecture why, what kind of interesting things we can do in that way. But as to where the surfaces come from, it just turns out that, I mean, you're just given a curve over a field. I mean, there's no obvious way to produce a graph from it. You really, because the graph's going to come from the irreducible components of um, the special fiber. The special fiber is only defined for models. I mean, you only have a reduction map. You want to, OK, so maybe let me say it a different way. What we're really doing is studying degenerations of curves. So secretly, what a model is, is you can think of it as a, a family of curves where you start with something smooth and you move in a family until you get to something reducible. And um, 
the graphs associated to that reducible thing. And um, so it's a way of degenerating from smooth things to singular things that are, that are reducible. And the reason you do that, well, this is a technique in algebraic geometry that goes all the way back to like the 19th century um, and to the early 20th century and the Italian algebraic geometers. You want to study divisors on curves or um, things about the moduli space of curves, uh, like brill nerder theory that we'll talk about next time. Uh, the, a key technique is you don't want to just study smooth curves, but you want to put them in families that are degenerating because it's often easier to prove things about degenerate limits than to prove things about smooth curves. And I mean, this is really the idea of tropical geometry as well, as well as other classical techniques like limit linear series and um, uh, other things um, in, in algebraic geometry where uh, somehow we can actually prove things about uh, once we break the curve apart into pieces. I mean, for example, you can start using induction on um, the genus of the components or something like that. But in our case, the idea is that the common torics of how those reducible components fit together will still remember some information about the original curve. That's why we're doing it. Awesome, thank you. And one, this is the last question. So um, is there a reference for where um, this has been used to prove something about graphs? So where, uh, where these ideas have been used, sorry, where these ideas have been applied to use curves to prove something about graphs? Yeah, that's one of the things I'll talk about in my next lecture. Um, again, in, you'll find it in my <clears throat> paper with Dave Jensen, but just to say in words, um, I'll talk, one application is the following. I mean, there's a real nerder theorem in algebraic geometry. I'm not going to state it now because we're already way over time, but um, it has two directions. So one direction, um, tells you, okay, there's a certain thing called the brill nerder number that I, I'll define next time. If the brill nerder number is non-negative, it tells you that there exists certain linear series on every curve, so certain divisors with certain degrees and ranks, if you like. And if the brill nerder number is negative, it tells you that on a generic curve of genus G, you don't have such a divisor. Um, and so actually you can, use this in both directions. So you can show using the algebraic geometry theorem and the specialization inequality that I just wrote down that um, curves, sorry, every graph uh, with non-negative brill nerder number has a divisor of that degree in rank. Um, you can also go the other direction, produce graphs which don't have certain linear series and deduce the classical out, uh, non-existence part of brill nerder theory from that. But to answer this question, the interesting direction is um, for proving combinatorial theorems is, is that we get a brill nerder theory for graphs, more specifically for metric graphs, which I'll talk about next time. And there's a little technical um, thing here that I'm skipping over, but, uh, the point is, it is a purely combinatorial theorem. It follows from the brill nerder theorem in algebraic geometry, and no one has yet uh, found a purely combinatorial proof of this theorem. So it's actually still a completely open problem to prove this theorem using combinatorics, this theorem that's purely about graphs, um, that we know is true just because we can deduce it from a hard theorem in algebraic geometry. So that's an example for you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. And we'll be back on Wednesday. Great.